Welcome, everyone, to What the Force, and welcome to a cool interview with Sarah Kuhn. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much. And Sarah, this is your hmm, first endeavor with Star Wars, I would say. That's correct. <laughs> Dr. Afra, original audiobook. Yes. What an undertaking. This is the second <laughs> official one that has come out in the new canon material under Disney. And it, it's spectacular. Thank you. It feels like you have a really amazing grasp of the character, but like she kind of was already established in the 2015 yeah. run of Vader. Do you want to just talk a little bit about how you kind of took on this character, what you what you ran with? Sure. I was a huge fan of the character. I love Afra. I think she's, you know, maybe the best person in, in Star Wars. Certainly one of the people who's having the most fun in Star Wars, which is very important. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. I was a big fan of her and I was a big fan of those comics. I think what Karen Gillan and Salvador La Roca established was really incredible. I mean, if you go back and read them, which I, I did for the purpose of doing this <laughs> uh, many, many times, um, you can really see how she just grabs you by the throat immediately. She's on the page and you can't really look anywhere else. Um, I think it's maybe one of the best introductions to a new character that I've ever read or seen or anything. So obviously, I think she was just like so inspiring from the beginning. What we kind of had to do, and we is Elizabeth Schaefer, who's the editor at Del Rey, she's amazing, and uh, Nick Martorelli, who produced the audio drama and did such an incredible job. Mm -hmm. um, we had kind of a couple of um, establishing phone calls where we, we talked through some things. And um, we were sort of talking about like, okay, so you have like the pieces of, these sto of this story. You have kind of the pieces of what she's going through when she is first introduced and then obviously taking it um to the end of um i guess like her big her big arc invader which takes her up until the point where it appears that she has been jettisoned out of the airlock and then you find out that she of course ingeniously faked her death because she knew that darth vader would never actually let her go we sort of took all the pieces of that. We figured out, you know, what are the times where she's off screen, where we could maybe expand on that a little bit? What are some things we can fill in? Who is telling this story was kind of a big question we talked about right away. Because mm -hmm. I think obviously, the obvious choice is Afro. But you know, there's, you know, like, I think one suggestion was like, oh, it could maybe be from triple zero's perspective maybe he's telling me you know much the way that that uh, afra observed vader maybe he's observing her too i really wanted to tell it in afra's voice i think um mm -hmm. that was something that felt very suited to a lot of the writing that i do already and she's just such a fun character and i mean why wouldn't you want to hear it in her voice she's so unreliable like you don't always yeah. know what she's telling you is totally the truth so I really wanted to hear from her and I wanted this to be in her POV. And then we kind of talked about like places we could expand. But for the most part, they kind of let me run with that sort of came up with this. Uh, I don't know what you would call it, like a framing device where she's recording this. And there is perhaps the idea that she is recording it. Um, for a specific purpose, but we don't really know what that is. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, what I will often do when I'm doing something licensed or when I'm brainstorming around an already established character is to sort of pull out something where you're like, what is really interesting to me about this story? What is something that I can bring to it um, to maybe make it, you know, recognizable enough that this is still the story that the fans want to hear that you know they're already fans of but what's a way to sort of make it something also different just so that they don't feel like they're getting you know the same story over and over again um and for me that was really her relationship with son of Staros. that was something that i've always loved i love both of those characters mm -hmm. um, oh san is so good <laughs> it's so good yeah i i think there were so many hints about you know the most of when we see them is in the 
aftermath when obviously they have not treated each other very well. And yeah. we get the sense that probably Afra treated her a little bit worse um, just because of who <laughs> she is and how angry Sana is every time she sees her. Um, and so I was kind of like, I feel like, you know, there's something there that I really want to explore that I think can give it um, this emotional heft so that we see that, you know, Afra, for all her bravado and her swagger, and her lying and her adventure seeking. I mean, she does have feelings. We have seen that in, you know, both the Vader series and then in her, um, in the, the comic series that she headlines. I feel like we have seen that. And so that was just something I kind of wanted to bring out. What's underneath the swagger and what are some things that I want to write about? And what is this, you know, relationship that has always been really interesting to me? The power of both the unreliable narrator and almost how she's lying to herself the mm -hmm. whole time and really like through processing her experiences with Vader because yeah like Vader is very much a reflection and she's able to reflect upon her own experiences through looking at Vader and his lenses and how he's looking at her mm -hmm. it's just so well done but I love that we slowly start to confront the emotions that she's been hiding from, you know, yeah. <laughs> throughout the whole the whole audiobook is just like it it it's a, it's actually breathtaking at some moments oh, how well it's constructed and thought through to give us this incredible look at this anti-heroine because like she she is a heroine of her own story of course <laughs> yes but she's she doesn't always choose the right thing and we're seeing that through the story uh but I think that there's regret in there and that's part of what I love about this is that it exposes kind of the the squishy center to this very hard and hardened yeah. exterior <laughs> well I think that um the key for me in this, I think, was um, she has, a you know, this brilliant line. She has so many brilliant lines that Kieran Gillen wrote for her. Oh, I mean, yeah. just some of the things he came up with are so amazing and so e epic, like so iconic still. And so she had said something early where um, it's something like, uh, you know, the way I've lived, I know I'm lucky to be alive. And she's saying this while she's asking Darth Vader, you know, I know you're going to kill me. When you do it, can you make sure it's the lightsaber? I don't want the airlock. I, I have nightmares. Like, it's this really interesting thing where she's basically acknowledging, like, I know this is going to happen and here's how I want it to happen because I still want to, you know, kind of act like I have some kind of control over this. And I thought that was really interesting because I feel like, for me, one of the most interesting things about her character is that she is such chaos. She is so craving danger and thrills at all times. She kind of runs towards these situations, which are always bad and which, you know, <laughs> are going to end badly for her. And yet she also has this really hardwired in survival instinct that, you know, came from growing up the way she grew up and mm -hmm. sort of having to harden herself against so many things. And so I thought it was really interesting that this person who is basically like, I know you're going to kill me, do it this way, is also at some point in this story, at some point in this story, she kind of realizes, I actually really don't want to die. Yeah. Um, you know, like, I, I keep make, talking this big game about how I want my death to be so, you know, like, I want it to be exactly this way. But at the core of it, I actually don't want to die. I would actually prefer not to have any kind of death and so I thought that was that was something that seemed to me like kind of in conflict but also very human and I thought if we could explore the sort of motivations behind that the you know the way that she goes through this arc of realizing that that would be really interesting and also I felt kind of just that one line really unlocked the character for me it's it's very interesting that she asked Vader, who is this like, you know, boogeyman monster of the original trilogy for compassion, mm -hmm. right? Like she asked, 
she asked him for compassion, which is, you know, love and, uh, you know, don't kill me that way, kill me this way. Yeah. Um, but through the course of her journey in, in the, you know, in the story, she realizes how important that love that she had for Santa was to her and the, and the, and the love that Santa had for her. And it's like, that was what inspired her to be like, no, actually, even though I have this death wish or I, I feel like I'm all constantly on the edge of dying, at least for me, that yeah. it was like and, that spark. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I think what that kind of makes her realize going back to something um, you had, you had said before that sort of inspired me to go on that long uh, verbal exploration <laughs> was um, just that I felt like one part of her realization was like, if I did die now, I would still have regrets. Like it wouldn't be this mm-hmm. sort of going down in a blaze of glory kind of situation. I would still like at the last moment before it happened, I would still have these things about my life that I regret. And I think for a character like Afra, who really, you know, at times seems like there is not a whole lot that she actually feels bad about. Um, I think that's a big thing to kind of realize that takes a lot of sort of stripping away of this, this persona that she's built um, Mm -hmm. to get to that deeper realization. So that was fascinating to me as well is like, why is this person sort of fighting so hard um, to stay alive when she keeps saying that she wants to have like all these sort of, you know, epic history book worthy adventures and this sort of history book worthy death. And I felt like there, there's a lot she's fighting here. And some of it is the survival instinct. And some of it is also that she knows that if it happened right now, there would be some things that despite everything and despite what she says, she still feels kind of bad about. Um, she still w- either wishes she'd done differently or that she could, you know, I guess somehow make some kind of amends for that or whatever it is. Um, and I thought, you know, since I am uh, such a romantic <laughs> and such a, a romance lover, I just thought, like, obviously, that would be a regret she would have that Sana is still furious with her, just hates her, and yeah. thinks that, you know, Afra never really cared about her at all, which is obviously not true. Um, I feel like even when they bicker, you can tell. I mean, they're bickering that hard because at some point there was real love there. So I just thought that was interesting that, like, you know, that would be kind of one of her regrets, that she never really got to be honest with this person that she actually does care about. Absolutely. It was beautifully done. I I felt like the romantic themes and the confrontation of those emotions throughout the story really drove how we felt about Afra and you know, we sympathize with her even though she makes frustrating decisions. <laughs> right. <laughs> I also loved as kind of a sub theme that was related to the, you know, love that she has for Santa, how much in denial she is in the love she had for her mother, even though she didn't see eye to eye, at least at the time in her childhood, the decisions that her mother made. And I felt like that was yeah. a very powerful way to show a mother relationship um especially in star wars where we don't really treat our moms so well right (laughs) which is like me a personal beef about star wars but (laughs) you know people also lose a lot of hands and yeah we got we got to move past those things (laughs) too but i loved how at the moment of her realization you know she's out in space the the climax as you will from a character perspective it was both santa and the love her mother had for her that really you know brought her full circle yeah i mean i think that i believe it was uh, simon spurrier did such an amazing job of kind of exploring like what that past relationship was when she was a little girl and her mom kind of carted her out to this you know desolate (laughs) planet and she didn't really understand why i thought he did such an amazing job of kind of exploring that um in his run on afra and that was certainly something that i also took inspiration from um was sort of this idea that also we 
oftentimes do not realize what our like what our parents are doing or why they are doing it until we're older and we have some first perspective. And sometimes you might still be like, wow, that was messed up. Like there's really, <laughs> there's really no like, mom, like, why? Yeah, why? There's really <laughs> no good big, big picture lesson I can learn from this. Other than maybe what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> and what not to do. And you know, I think Afra as she's presenting herself, like the way that she wants people to see her, she's kind of presenting it as like, I don't know why this happened. And I feel like all it did was mess me up and get my mom killed and it was not good in any way, shape or form, <laughs> except to show me that I do not want to be this kind of weak person that I eventually saw my mother being because she basically took me to this place because she loved me so much. She thought that would be safe. And, um, you know, then of course the trick is like in this galaxy, there's really nowhere you can go where you're 100% <laughs> safe. That's what leads to things like people losing hands. <laughs> so um, I think, um, but I think that really, like, if you really pressed her on it, she would sort of be able to say like, okay, actually, I do see how my father was doing some stuff that was not super great. And, you know, some of it was that some of it was, you know, my mom really did think that this was safe. She really did love me. I really could feel that. I think that if if push comes to shove, that is something that that maybe she can admit. And I think what I kind of wanted her to see was there's really no way to make yourself safe from feelings. Mm. Um, you know, like, yeah, there's, there's nowhere you can run. There's nowhere you can hide. Like those feelings are going to get you eventually. And I think what she's actually scared of is that moment right before you die, which she keeps talking about in terms of her mother, in terms of Padme, in terms of kind of all these people where you are sort of reduced to whatever your kind of base form is. And, mm -hmm. you know, your, your instinct is probably going to be, I don't want to die. So you're going to display these things that she thinks of as weak when actually, you know, they're just emotions. <laughs> they're just feelings again. Um, but I sort of, I sort of felt like that was like, um, and you know, this is like, this, I'm probably thinking of this because this is like a metaphor I used in a book that I just wrote, just not a Star Wars book. It was like <laughs> my original fiction. And, so like the heroin um, complex uh, This was actually for a or? book that's coming out next year. It's called uh, From Little Tokyo with Love. And it's, oh. it's a YA contemporary um kind of rom con. I, I sometimes write in the area of contemporary romance where there's, you know, usually no um, spaceships or magic powers or anything. <laughs> you know, people, people in a situation, having feelings, being cute, all of that. And um, that's it, important, it's, though, it's even if spaceships it's, are there. It's very important. And I think that Something that I sort of thought of while I was working on both Afra and that book were um, I I love roller coasters like I love scary <gasps> rides I love you know the, the Guardians of the Galaxy ride at um, at Disneyland like I yep. love all of that but there is always that moment right before I get on the ride or when I'm on the ride and it's sort of about to about to happen or the big drop on the roller coaster is going to happen or like whatever the kind of scary thing is where I'm suddenly like, oh, no, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want to be here. Like, can I get on this ride? Like, <laughs> and a regret. I sort of, yeah, I, I sort of, um, I mean, maybe Afro would also regret that she never got to go on a roller coaster. I feel like maybe that would be, there would be something there. But I was, I, I realized that the reason I had that feeling is because I know when I, when I go into that drop or when the scary part of the ride happens, I will have to feel something. You know, mm. that's why everybody screams. That's why they they sort of like build up the anticipation of that drop where the roller coaster starts going slower and slower until you get to the top. And then it kind of pauses and then it plunges you to the bottom. And so I was like, huh, that's interesting that there, are time, there have been times in my life where I'm like, oh, I don't want to go on that roller coaster. And it's not because I'm scared of like being on the roller coaster. It's because I'm scared of having feelings. Um, so oh, Sarah. Like, 
I think that there was something to that that really reminded me of Afra, where like she wants the thrills and she wants the excitement and she wants all of these like exciting, stimulating things. But the one thing that she's really scared of is having feelings and then also having other people know she has feelings. Right. Um, and I thought that's exposing the soft, squishy bits. Expo- <laughs> what she still thinks of as being a weakness, you know, right. going back to her mother's love. She still thinks that that is somehow weakness. Um, so that, of course, is something that, you know, as a writer, is just so fun to explore. It's delicious, even. It's yes. awesome. And I loved how you put just now, like the, the, hey, you're, you're afraid to have to confront this part of you that, yeah, you know, normally can, you can either keep locked away and it, and it is a certain amount of control, right? Because, yeah, you know, falling in love or expressing those emotions is giving a piece of yourself to somebody else, yeah. even if it's just expressing that to them. Yeah, it's kind of making yourself, it's making yourself vulnerable to them and letting them know that you are vulnerable to them. And that's something that is obviously, you know, kind of repulsive to her. I mean, (laughs) she she likes to throw herself into the chaos, but she also kind of, she likes to be in control of the chaos. That's part of the bravado and the, the, you know, the sort of thing that she projects out there. Um, So yeah, I just thought, that would that would really be her ultimate nemesis. It's not Darth Vader. It's her own feeling. There's a beautiful parallel with her trying to get under Vader's armor and find out the truth mm-hmm. about Padme and and you know the Skywalker kid who blew up the Death Star, yeah. and then her <laughs> slowly revealing to herself what is under her armor that she you know, goes back and deletes in her own audio recording and doesn't want to confront directly until the life death kind of situations that she ends (laughs) up in. It's such a beautiful parallel um, and how much that reflection of her in Vader's eyes and what she thinks. She's trying trying to figure out what Vader thinks of her, but really what matters is what she thinks of herself in the end. Right. (laughs) Just so good. There's also, you know, this this really interesting kind of triad that happens between death, life, and love of yourself kind of carrying you on. And mm-hmm. it just, it, it flows so nicely through the unreliable narrator. And, and slowly <laughs> as we, we crack open that armor around, around Chelly Afra. I know that you added that in just because of our earlier conversation here, but like the the going back and re-recording and <laughs> and really emphasizing that unreliable narrator was just brilliant. Did you want to talk about how you got into that headspace? Oh, sure. I mean, the really pushing that element of it was something that Elizabeth Schaefer, the editor, like mm-hmm. she really pushed me to do that and come up with ways to do it and kind of take advantage of both um, Afra the character, because that obviously is something she would do, but also the audio format, since we were writing this, um, you know, directly for audio, which is Mm -hmm. interesting. That's not something that I've ever done before. You have to think in a different way because you're like, okay, what what am I narrating? What am I? Yeah, exactly. You really do. Especially since it was, you know, I've written a lot of comics and this was adapted from a comic. And what's interesting about that is in comics, a lot of times I cut a lot of my words as the writer because the art is doing so much of the work. You know, you don't have to say how someone's the expression on someone's face looks because you can see it. Um, It's not, you know, it's not something where I have to pontificate for like a paragraph about what someone's face looks like. (laughs) And with this, it was interesting because it felt almost like a combination of a lot of the the different mediums I've written in of prose and comics and screenwriting and all of that, just because you are writing for something where people can't see what's going on. So you have to paint a picture like you do in prose, but it's also written in a script format and you have to be careful about like 
not disrupting the flow of action too much with like a lot of digressions with, you know, extensive description of ev- absolutely everything. Right. Um, so that was an interesting challenge. And um, I really loved that Elizabeth wanted us to push the idea that, you know, this is Afra. Like when, if she's making a recording, she's obviously going to tinker with it as she goes. Right. And so a lot of it was just kind of looking at it. And I think this was something we really did mostly in the revision was finding these spots where it was like, okay, this is what happened in the action that's in the comic book. This is what we're seeing on the page, what we're hearing. But now this is so from Afra's perspective. One, how did she see this? Like, how did this go down that was maybe a little bit different? Um, from say how Vader saw it or how we as like an observer are are looking at it from the outside. And then where would she kind of want to make it better? Not better in terms of just of quality, but ter- in terms of like better for her. Like how, how do you how <laughs> Like if you could rewrite your own legend. Yeah, exactly. Because like this is, this is something that could... Yeah be found and then she could be that yeah. adventurer that she would want to be if you could make it from your own words yeah. yeah and you know who hasn't had that moment where we're where you're like either fighting with someone or you're trying to make a statement or you're like making a first impression and then you do it and you're you've been so caught up in the kind of the heat of the moment that like it doesn't go very well or like your kind of one line or retort is actually not that good Um, Or you just like clam up or freeze up and you don't like do exactly, you know, how you pictured this moment going. And so I felt like that was something that she would be like, oh, now I can I can control this. Like I am in charge of this narrative. And I think she would be very aware of the fact that, like, as you said, someone could find this someday. And if she's as famous as, you know, she likes to imagine she will be once (laughs) once she reaches the end of her life, then what what would she want them to hear? So I like this idea of like, um, you know, for example, that I think that first moment where she kind of changes something is when she meets Darth Vader and he pulls her up from her very precarious perch where she's like hanging off of this, like this kind of cliff. And he says like, you know, I have need of you. He doesn't really explain very much because he's Darth Vader. And she's like, just, she's heard of him. Like she knows all the the legends and the stories. And she's kind of like, oh my God, like Darth Vader wants to work with me. And so I thought like she would want her kind of first introduction to him and what she says to him to be very epic. And so (laughs) instead of just being like, okay, I'm going to, you know, I I agree and I'm going to go with you. She's like, no, 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 that's not what happened. What happened is I totally gave this amazing speech that obviously he was very impressed by. And then she makes up the speech. And I just thought, you know, that's something like we all have done. We all have like imagined that moment where we're like, oh, here's what would have happened if I actually had time to think about it. And I had kind of done what I wanted to do. And I was, you know, so totally amazing in this moment. Um, So I like it for that, just in terms of her being able to turn up these moments where she wanted to appear maybe more, you know, heroic or more amazing, Mm -hmm. or you can just imagine, you know, the soundtrack playing behind her and like the fire and like whatever else is going on. Um, And then obviously the other thing that she uses, that, that we use that device for a lot is that when she starts to get a little too real, and she mm-hmm. kind of forgets like, oh, I'm, I'm recording this for a purpose and other people are going to hear it. Um, you know, she gets obviously way too vulnerable and she starts to express what those feelings are that she's so afraid of. And she kind of like lets her heart be more clear to people. And yeah. so I just thought like she'd say that stuff and then she'd be really uncomfortable with it. And then she'd want to go back and delete it. And You know, again, like, I feel like all of us who are, like, writing in our diaries or our live (laughs) journals or, like, whatever was around when you were younger, (laughs) there's always, like, that thing that you go back and delete or, like, if you Mm -hmm. have, like, a paper diary, it's, like, the page you tear out or, like, you cross out. 
because you're like, oh my God, I yeah, like this is, you know, this is supposed to be just for me and my confessions, but wow, I really don't want anyone to know I felt that way ever. Um, Absolutely. And so like, I just thought like, she would, of course, be the person who would who would do that. Like she would, of course, want to make this recording so she sounds the best and the most heroic. And I loved playing with that because I think at the beginning, she is describing herself in these kind of larger than life terms. She talks about, you know, how beautiful she is and like, how she's always doing these like amazing and genius things that no one else has ever thought of. And then as the recording progresses, of course, that starts to break down a little bit. And again, show you kind of what's underneath all that bravado that she's worked very hard on. I really appreciate how much you make it Chelly real for us. Like she's she's real, of course, like in the in the comics, but like messy anti heroines are like my <laughs> new love, like uh, <laughs> birds of prey. Yeah, you know, like it, the idea that women can have, you know, maybe morally gray reasoning. They don't have to be perfect, wearing white, all in white, and being like, you know, out there saving the day. They can have love. They can have you know, messy romances, they yeah. can get their egg sandwich at the end of a movie. <laughs> yeah. You know, like that idea to me is like just really, really important to show women being real, even mm-hmm. if they are the hero of their own story. And Chelly fulfills like all of that. <laughs> and she's smart. Like she she's almost too smart for her own good because yeah. it ends up leading her down this like incredible greedy path. And that's like one of her, <laughs> her big, her big problems too is like, okay, well, how can this like, you know, make me cooler, but really she's still this like squishy person on the inside. And I just, I love it. But why are these anti-heroines so important? Like Dr. Afra? Wow. I feel like she would really hate that you said, that she has a squishy inside. I know, I know, I'm sorry, but we got to see it. So mad, Um, (laughs) no, I agree. I mean, I, like, Birds of Prey, I think is like one of the best movies ever. Yes. I think like, it's so beautifully done. And I love that it also had like, different kinds of women in it, you know, all of those Mm -hmm. characters were also really different from each other and kind of had different goals that eventually came together. That movie is like perfect. But I think, you know, it just speaks to the idea that we are not all one thing. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, when I um, when I was first writing uh, Heroin Complex, which is my series of novels about Asian American superheroines, there are a team of them and they, they fight things in San Francisco like um, demonic cupcakes and uh, supernatural karaoke. Like, it's just to give you an idea of the show. <laughs> not super serious. But um, they, you know, work together to do all of that. And I am Asian American. And I remember when I was first working on that, there was kind of this question. And this is before, you know, I had sent it to any agents or before it had been published or anything. But there was kind of this idea that some people put forth to me, which is, they will not let you have more than one. It's already, it's already kind of like, you know, a lot, quote unquote, that you have this Asian American superheroine lead. But first of all, sometimes it's still hard to have multiple women on a team. Which is, yeah. You know, okay. Um, they have to be like some kind of token, but especially if they're women of color and especially if they're like, of the same like ethnicity like that was just like oh my god like no why would you have more than one like they'll make you make at least one of them white and luckily the people I ended up working with did not do that and in fact encouraged me to do you know what I actually wanted to do um, which is to show this kind of um, this sisterhood but also that there are different ways that we can be heroes there are different ways that we can be main characters the two main characters in Heroin Complex are opposite personalities. Like they are completely different and they are heroes for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And it was also important for me to show that within that, our heroes are also human. They're always flawed. They are not perfect people. Um, They're always making some kind of mistake. (laughs) 
just because I think that's that's more interesting and that is more real. And, you know, I went through the, I think a lot of, you know, women of color writers go through this where you're writing something from that's kind of from your own experience. And then you're like, oh my God, this character is like such a bad role model. Like they're <laughs> so like not necessarily what you expect people to like be looking up to and emulating because they're not perfect. But I actually think that having someone be messy and flawed is what you want people to sort of look to is like, yes, this person does all of this, but they're still a hero. They still kind of do whatever the right thing is at the end of the day. Um, and I think that's one thing that was so amazing about Birds of Prey is you have all these people with different motivations and they come together. And at the end of the day, they all do the right thing. And then, you know, and then afterwards, it's like, okay, like, maybe this life is not, you know, for <laughs> Harley, like, she wants to go, like, she does want to go have her egg sandwich, she is kind of, you know, dedicated to maybe some different things than the ladies who, who eventually formed the birds of prey. But in this moment, they were all heroes, they were all different kinds of heroes, they were all flawed, they were all making mistakes, but they still came together, and they still made the right choice, and they still did the, the right thing. Mm -hmm. Um and, you know, I don't know if Afra uh, always does the right thing. Um, I would say she, there's actually quite a bit she, of evidence. She does. Contrary. Well, no. But, I mean, but neither so, neither do do those heroines that, no, I you mean, know. In, in, a, in a big picture sense, I mean, I feel like it, that is still interesting. Like the, being able to see a variety of characters, being able to sort of, get with the idea that women are not all one thing yeah. and that we do make mistakes. And when we are heroes or when we are protagonists, we are also not always perfect, I think is something that's really important to get out there. Um, and the more that we have, the, the more that sort of everyone will be able to kind of have their hero or their person they look up to or their protagonist that they feel like is their own. Um, so I do love writing heroines of all kinds, and I do tend to write heroines that no matter what their circumstances or, you know, what their life is like, they are very messy because I feel like a lot of times I'm messy, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not perfect. I, I do a lot of, you know, I'm sure there have been plenty of times where I've definitely not made what would maybe be seen as the right choice. And so I just think there's something, um, maybe it's just that there's just something invigorating, I think, about seeing that kind of reality reflected in stories. Yeah. And I, I think that it's, although fiction, you know, and fiction can play out fantasies or it can play out, you know, how to solve problems on a grand scale, you're never going to be faced with an intergalactic conflict like <laughs> well, Afra, hopefully. right? Or, we'll or you know, or, or, you know, in the end, she actually does make the right choice from, you know, and, and helps the quote unquote meta plot of Star Wars, because she right. doesn't sell out, <laughs> you know, Luke Skywalker to the Emperor and yeah. betray Vader's most important secret, which yes. she does understand <laughs> that that is the most important secret. So in some ways, even though, you know, she is fulfilling this kind of role of like, you know, trying to get out of the situation. Um, she is trying to save herself and that, you know, living is important as we see through, uh, through the course of the, of the story. And I love that we get to see her not only, you know, fulfilling her goals, even though they're messy and how she gets to them throughout throughout everything, fulfilling her boss's goals, right, because <laughs> she helps out Vader. But also we get kind of, you know, auxiliary enhancements throughout the whole thing. And and in the end, she is successful at escaping Vader alive and, yeah. you know, keeping the secrets secret that are really important and uplifting her boss and then realizing that, you know, maybe <laughs> this maybe there needs needed to be a separation there. <laughs> yeah. And I also always like that, um, even though it all goes to crap later, I do love that she ends this arc with kind of a crew, 
like yeah. kind of a team. And she kind of tries to act like, oh, it's just like, you know, they were just there, like, no, no big deal. Um, but I think there actually is a sense that for better or for worse, she has kind of done her version of bonding yeah. <laughs> with with these other beings that she then enlists in this plan to basically save her. Um, so I think you also see like, even though like, whenever Afra is part of like any kind of crew or team, it, it usually doesn't last, <laughs> um, probably for, for everybody's benefit. I do think that there's kind of this idea that like, she goes into things being like, oh, I'm just here for myself. Like, we all know I'm so selfish that I'm only out for myself, like, etc. But I think, hopefully, you also get a sense that like, at the end, she actually does care about these other beings that she's mm-hmm. been thrown together with. She does, even though like, they've all kind of tried to kill each other at different points, like, she does have a sense of like, okay, like, at least for whatever this next adventure is, these are kind of my people. Um, obviously, that can change very fast. But uh, I have bonded enough with these these other beings that I want to go on another adventure with them, which for her does feel like, you know, whatever counts as like character growth, <laughs> or, you know, gro- growth as a person. I mean, you know, sometimes character growth uh, for people and for characters is very slow. And yeah. <laughs> we we do see some in this uh, with Afra, especially with self-realization that she doesn't want Santa to think that she's the worst person in existence. Yes. yes. And that's really wonderful. So thank you for giving us beautiful romance in this story. It is. <laughs> It like it's very touching. It makes you misty. Uh, it it hurts sometimes, <laughs> and it it's just done exceptionally well. Thank you. So, how was it to uh, to handle the two murder droids, Triple <laughs> uh, Zero and BT? Oh, you know, it's just so much fun. I mean, I think um, like Triple Zero is like another character that you're just like, oh my God, like, how did they come up with this? This is so amazing. Because everything he says is, I mean, it's kind of a writer's dream, because he just keeps talking about how he wants to like murder people. And he does it in this kind of entertaining, like almost chipper way. It's I I feel like anything you write for him in that voice is just so good. Like you almost, (laughs) you almost can't write anything bad. Because like, that character like, is so well set up. I mean, they are like purposefully made to be like anti C three PO and R two D two. So like, yeah. like there's so many uh, like shadow reflections. Yes, in this story oh. of yes. like oh. in some ways, like Chelly is like sees herself in Vader, but doesn't want to see herself in Vader. Yeah. And we see R two D two and and. Uh, C-3PO literally being like replaced momentarily by their shadow selves, yeah. these murder droids. Like that's just such an interesting like theme and parallel to play with. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I, I you know, I think like with Triple Zero too, it's funny that sometimes the things he says are like so awful that it makes even Afra go like, whoa, like that's like... <laughs> Almost too, like, she still kind of goes with it, but... Semi too far, like, just (laughs) just toes, like... She's like, okay, like, you want to kill all the humans? (laughs) Like, okay. But, yeah, I mean, they they are just, they are just a delight. It was fun to see, too, in the comic book, like, how sometimes the beats, like, from um, BT and R2 are, like, written with different sound effects to like show that they're kind of like these two sides of a coin, but they still kind of like sound different. Yeah. And I remember with, with the triple zero, I think Nick Martorelli, the producer talked a little bit about this on the, uh, on the Dr. Afro panel we did for uh, comic con this year, but uh, the actor is uh, Sean Keenan and he had to kind of come up with this voice because I remember when we were working on the script, we sort of talked about like, oh, actually, like, we haven't heard this voice before. Like, what does he sound like? Does he sound just like C-3PO? Like, in in the actual sort of, like, tone (laughs) of his voice, like, what does he sound like? Like, I think we were always like, yes, he definitely has, like, an accent. Like, 
he has like that kind of sense of, of like propriety about him, like yeah. that sort of like almost stuffiness, but it's obviously being deployed differently. And there is a scene where um, we had to add something where uh, like sometimes audio would give me these great notes of like, oh, remember that like they can't see this or like we need a way to like show what this is in the dialogue so that people aren't confused. And so there's a part where there's a part where um, Afra uh, disguises triple zero as C3PO by like painting him gold. And we were like, okay, how can we show that like, he's also going through this like acting change basically to like to, to portray C3PO. So um, they were like, maybe you could show him like trying to change his voice or so then I was like, oh, well, does, you know, what does he sound like? Do we think, do we think it's close to, you know, what we think of as classic Anthony Daniels? Like, season two, or is it, like <laughs> I love this scene or, so much. Yeah. So we did, I ended up adding that little thing where I'm like, okay, well, if he does sound different, why don't we do this thing where he's like going through these tests of changing his voice <laughs> and he's changing like the words he's saying. So he thinks he sounds like more of a kiss up, like what he thinks of as C-3PO. Um, right, because they're like traitors to him. Yeah, because they're, yeah. they're they're serving the humans, so they're obviously traitors to like the droid cause. Um, and so that was just really fun to think about. Like, what would he, you know, what would he sort of go through to like change his voice? How much does he need to change his voice? And then I think the the voice, the actual voice that Sean and Nick came up with for him is just brilliant. Like, I think we, mm -hmm. like, when we discussed it, um, Nick said something like, well, you know, it's like C-3PO is very, like, passive aggressive, but triple zero is just, like, aggressive. Like, he's not, <laughs> he's not really trying to hide it. And the only reason you might be fooled is because he still does have that kind of proper accent. Yeah. It, it, I really love that, that, like, banter between, BT and triple zero comes through and it's it 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 gives me the like you know when you see a new hope for the first time feel of the narration in some ways like mm -hmm. secondary narration even though we're getting it narrated right. by right, Afra right. but like of the moment in in a new hope the eyes of the audience are C3PO and R2D2 right. having their their running uh commentary on the situations that they experience right and I think that's something that, you know, like we expanded on, but I felt like Kieran had set it up so well. Like, I love that, like, that, like a lot of times when Triple Zero is like confiding in BT in that sort of way you describe, he's kind of basically saying like, our mistress is like going to get herself, herself killed and every idea she has is bad. And here's another one. Like, I just love that he's kind of like, you know, not really hiding his disdain <laughs> or um, <laughs> the fact that he like absolutely can see that what she's doing is always a bad idea. And his sort of coping mechanism is that, you know, he can talk to BT about it and talk about how it's such a bad idea. And so I just love that. And I love that we were able to expand on it a little bit. Vader is like, this puzzle that she's trying to solve this whole time. And as she gets closer and closer, he gets, I, I think, more upset with her. Yeah. <laughs> um, how did you like get into this mindset? I know it's from Afra's view, but like, yeah. you know, it, she wants to poke the bear. <laughs> yeah. well, and she's almost drawn <laughs> to that, you know, like, yeah, I mean, I think it just goes back to and you know, Elizabeth, and I had a lot of conversations about this while we were work working on various drafts like about you know her motivation and how she kind of has to like obviously talk about it more since we are hearing from her in this very mm -hmm. long internal monologue that Emily Wu Zeller just knocked out of the park oh yeah um, I think she had to talk for like five hours straight. Elizabeth and I talked a lot about her motivation at various points and while we were working on this and how we could kind of like, you know, construct this arc for her. And I just thought that, um, you know, obviously, and we talked about this a lot, like how does she kind of see him at first? How does that change? How is are her little wheels kind of turning the whole time? And 
So there is definitely, you know, an element of, of fear because yeah. she knows what he is um, and he's showing her what she is. But being Afra, she also sees him as, you know, a mark as like, okay, yeah. I see this person. This person is obviously very powerful. How can I use that to my advantage? And I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier, where they have this kind of mirror thing going on, where she knows that if she can find his weakness, she can exploit it. And because she's scared of someone finding whatever her weakness is, which she thinks doesn't exist, she sort of instinctively knows that's how you get someone. You figure out what the, what the weak spot is, and then you figure out how to use it to your advantage. Um, and kind of another thing that developed as we were working on it that I really liked is I also thought that, yes, the whole time, you know, she is scheming. She's trying to figure out how she can use him. She's trying to figure out what his weakness is and <laughs> trying to, like, plot and scheme. At the same time, she is also drawn to this idea that this obviously powerful, dangerous person thinks that she's important, you know, thinks that she has like these skills that no one else has that he really needs. She can sort of be like this person for him and then eventually, you know, perhaps ascend to her own, you know, her own throne of power, like whatever that that looks like. And so I, I really like that because I always thought there is still something that even though she's scheming, even though she's seeing him as a mark, even though she's trying to figure out what his weakness is, she's still loving this. Like she's still loving these adventures. Like even if they're scary, mm -hmm. sometimes because they're scary, like <laughs> she's loving this. It's like the most thrilling, like most important, you know, secret job that she's ever had. And so one thing that Elizabeth and I talked a lot about was like, there's this moment where, He's basically like, okay, you're useless to me. I'm going to kill you now. And she's upset, not just because she's about to die, but also because she realizes in that, this moment, oh, he actually doesn't see me as important. He mm. sees me as another drone. I'm another bug. I'm another like small thing that is going to be crushed in his quest for whatever he's questing after. And so even though like, it's not like, you know, she necessarily has warm, fuzzy feelings for him. Although I know, well, you know, maybe a few deep yeah. down. Um, maybe, maybe you know, you know like, she's a she's a villains fan, like so yeah, many of us. <laughs> like in a in a partner, like in a partnership kind mm -hmm. of way. Um, they and you know, some people are drawn to power, they, even if know, it's scary. And, yeah, but, and sometimes you know, you you develop like weird friendships with your coworkers because like, <laughs> you're spending a lot of time with them. Like, you know, she, like she's, he's one of the only people she, besides like her murder droids that she's spending a lot of time with. So I just, but I just thought like how interesting that this person who part of the reason for her bravado is that all of these people have kind of made her feel unimportant all her life. Like her professor's, um, you know, Utina Zane, who she was yeah. like the, the curator for. And then he like almost got her arrested or he did get her arrested. Like, you know, he still kind of sees her in this in this like lower like bug way. Um, her parents like both made her feel that way to some degree. And then she finally finds this person who she's like, oh, like he really went through a lot to get to me and he really needs my skills. And you know, I, he's, I'm doing such a good job at all these missions for him. Surely this means I am about to access whatever power he has. Um, and also, this is perhaps the only person who has ever seen me that way my entire life. You know, there's something appealing about that. Yeah. So I really like the idea of exploring that and of exploring kind of like, how her reaction and her view of him changes as they go through this adventure, what she's willing to admit to herself, what she's not willing to admit to herself. And, you know, then the other thing I love that this also kind of let us explore is I feel like she talks a lot about, um, oh, I'm scheming and I'm planning and, it, you know, this is going to reveal itself to me. And then I will make my most amazing elaborate master plan but the mustache is, twirl in there. Yeah. <laughs> but the truth is, like, her planning is usually 
to like observe a lot. And then at the very, like right when she's in her most dire circumstances, she has a terrible idea and she executes it and it usually turns out okay. So <laughs> it's like, I think she, we even gave her a line where she said something like, oh, usually my greatest plans don't reveal themselves to me until the very end. Um, and so like that chaos part of her is obviously something that's super appealing to me. And that I, I also like that element of the relationship with Vader that like the whole time she's trying, she keeps talking about like, yes, I am definitely making this incredible, very detailed master plan to use Vader to my advantage. Um, but then it, it's really not until like the very end that she actually figures out what that master plan is. They're such an interesting duo because he's yeah. all about order and control and like, you know, getting everything that he wants. And uh, she is this like chaos incarnate in some ways. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they uh, together are this very odd couple. And in the original comic, she added some much needed levity to uh, <laughs> yeah. a lot of uh, the situations it, but we don't get as much of the humor in her self dialogue I think uh, she's she's more humorous as like an external like when she's actually speaking to people as like yeah. I don't know some sort of um, you know coping mechanism or something yeah. with I have to socialize I'm going to make fun of stuff uh, yeah. <laughs> but internally we don't get as much of that and I, I think I just I really, really appreciate how raw she is with the monologue as it goes on and and how much we strip away the layers of the afro shaped onion that we get. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, I do have one last question, which is, okay. do you listen to music while you write? And what are some of your favorite Chelly Afra songs? <laughs> you know, I actually, uh, I don't listen to music while I write. I actually find it um, like too distracting. I have to have, um, I don't know, there's like a, a magic noise level that I have to have, but it has to be this kind of like, background, you know, murmury, like crowd noise. So I've written a lot in, in coffee shops. I'm obviously not really doing that right now. But um, that kind of has that level of noise that I need. And I actually don't usually wear headphones unless I'm trying to get someone to not bother me. Um, but um, I'm trying to remember if there was something that I listened to uh, while I was writing this. Usually what happens is, um, especially when I'm towards the end of something, there will be a song that is like that character's song. And then I don't <laughs> listen to it. I don't listen to it while I'm writing, but I listen to it obsessively, like in between or when I'm trying to um, processing or trying to work I'm through stuff. To process. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to remember if I had a song for this. And I actually... I don't remember. I think, um, you know, I like obviously for most of us this year is such a blur. Uh, of course, um, yeah. That that also seems like when was they working on this? January, February. That was like a million years ago. But I'm sure that if I if I had a song for her and if I remember it, I'll post it or I'll send it to you. I'm sure if I did, it was something extremely chaotic. Like it was just something that was like I don't know. Like I I think. Um, one thing about Afra is like she's such a mess, but she makes it work. Like she just, <laughs> no matter what happens, she always makes it work. And it's almost like if you look at, and I'm sure this was by design. Like if you look at sort of the elements of her, you're like, how is this person still alive? Like how are they walking around? How are they successful at anything? <laughs> like it's such a mess, but somehow she puts all of that into a blender and, or, you know, Kieran Gillen and Salvador La Rosa put it on a <laughs> blender and it works. Like, well, yeah, whatever comes out is like this delicious milkshake. It just works. And so I think like probably her song would be something like that, where if you look at like, if you just read about like, these are the elements of the song, it has this random like bass hook. It has this chaotic drum solo. It has like these guitars that don't go together. Like these vocals make no sense. Like what were they? even thinking 
Like you look at that on paper and then you listen to the song and you're like, oh my God, that's an amazing song. Like it has whatever, whoever put the magic on these different elements and brought them together made it work. Um, and somehow it's brilliant. And so <laughs> I, I need to figure out what that, you know, I'll try to figure out what that song was, but I think it would be something like that where you're sort of, of looking at it, you're like this is pure chaos I have no idea how this is going to work and then you read it or look you know you listen to the song and you're like actually brilliant <laughs> absolutely well everyone if you've already gotten all the way here and you haven't like stopped to go and listen to Afra pick it up I highly highly recommend you pick up Dr. Afra the original audiobook and of course, Sarah's work is also spectacular, and you should also pick up all the rest of her work, too. <laughs> Thank you. But Sarah, if people were looking for you online or where to find maybe lists of your books or all your work, where would they find that? Um, I'm on Twitter a lot. It's just my name, Sarah Kuhn, K-U-H-N. Um, usually, if I'm on there a lot, I'm probably avoiding something I'm supposed to be doing um, <laughs> and I'm on Instagram as Sarah Kuhn as Sarah Kuhn books because someone took Sarah Kuhn I don't know why maybe that was their name too no idea um, and then my website is heroinecomplex.com that's heroin like superhero but not like the drug um, <laughs> and although I probably really need to update it that's usually where you can find the basics of who I am and what I'm doing well, thank you for coming on the show and cheers. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to What the Force. I'm your host, Marie Claire Gould. Our music is orchestral music by Christy Carew, composed for What the Force. We have a Patreon at patreon.com slash what the force. We would like to thank all our patrons, especially those who love and are obsessed with What the Force. Brad, Cheryl Bell, Melody, Night Huntress, In Wild Space, Susan, Felicia, How Rude, Anna Perez, Macau Mom, Neil, James, and Joelle and Dee. Make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube or leave a five-star review on iTunes or other podcast apps. It helps others find the show. You can connect with us on Twitter at What The Force Show, What The Force Podcast on Facebook, and our website where we have expanded our content, including reviews, metas, and articles at whattheforce.ca. You can also connect with us on our Discord. Links are in the liner notes. Feel free to reach out and start a conversation. Cheers. Cheers.